So I think the best way to always start these is with a case presentation. So chief complaint is progressive low back pain, right lower extremity radiculopathy. This is a 39 year old female with two months of progressive low back pain and severe radiating pain into the right lower extremity. Uh, shooting electrical shock like pain that radiates down her right posterior lateral leg to the sole of her foot, also with associated numbness of the lateral foot. Ability to ambulate and perform usual activities has been severely impaired for the past few days. Pretty minimal past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, psoriasis, some meds, uh, takes an aspirin. Most of these have been related to her recent uh, pain, ibuprofen, Adderall, Norco, and then take some lisinopril for her uh, hypertension. On exam, left lower extremity is full strength, full strength in the right lower extremity, except four plus out of five in the knee and implantar flexion, somewhat limited by pain. Patchy loss of sensation over the right lateral foot and posterior, posterior lateral leg, positive straight leg ray test, and no clonus. This is the MRI that they got uh, for this patient. You can see here, uh, this is a lateral or a sagittal view of the uh, T2 MRI with disc degeneration at L5-S1 with a bulging disc at L5-S1 and an axial view here of that same T2 image with a right-sided paracentral or paramedian disc herniation. So a little bit of anatomy, the intervertebral disc really has three parts, the cartilaginous end plate, the nucleus pulposus, and the annulus fibrosus. And you can see that diagrammed in an axial view and in a more sagittal view uh, here below. Two other things to kind of keep in mind uh, in, the, in the back here, this is the posterior longitudinal ligament. And then in the front is the anterior longitudinal ligament. Those will become important as we talk about disc herniations and kind of where, where those end up and why they end up in those positions. Pathophysiology of, of the disc herniation. The nucleus pulposus is composed of a high concentration of proteoglycans. This is the center of the disc and often the part that herniates out. Increased, uh, there's an increased osmotic gradient between the nucleus and the adjacent plasma that leads to an influx of water when you're recumbent and an efflux of water when you're upright. When the disc degenerates over time, that leads to a decrease in the concentration of proteoglycans, a decrease in the influx of water, a constant efflux of water, ultimately leading to decreased elasticity and wear and tear of the annulus over time. Herniation uh, is secondary to preferential loss of the annulus with a disproportional strain on the nucleus, leading to herniation of the nucleus out of the annulus. The peak incidence of disc herniations occurs during the fourth decade, decade of life, usually somewhere between the third and the fifth decades. So, you know, somewhere in our 20s, 30s, 40s, maybe into our 50s is where we're looking at this. And then, you know, a good question here is, is why do we not see this in elderly population? And that's, it's, a, it's a good question. I think a lot of times the disc has degenerated so much at that point that you're unlikely to get a disc herniation, um, and, you know, with arthritis and other scarring in their back, it just seems much less likely. So we definitely see this mostly in kind of the middle-aged population, so to speak. Symptoms that we see here include radiculopathy and back pain. Radiculopathy is really the thing to focus on because that's going to help you determine where the disc herniation is and ultimately uh, is what we're successful at treating with microdiscectomy and laminectomies. There is both a compressive and an inflammatory component. So about 20% of people are asymptomatic even with a compressive disc herniation. So, you know, just like I tell patients in the office all the time, we don't treat the picture, we treat you. So if you have a huge disc herniation uh, that you got an MRI for some unusual reason, uh, we don't necessarily need to treat that if you're not symptomatic from it. Most patients uh, with radiculopathy due to a herniated disc clinically improve with time despite the persistence of radiologic findings. So if you leave somebody alone, if somebody says, you know, they have a big disc herniation, they have a bad acute radiculopathy, you offer them surgery, they say, no, I don't really want to have surgery. I don't want to go through that. If you, most people will improve on their own. It may take a very long time. And interestingly enough, a lot of times their radiographic findings don't get all that much better. And that 
is an interesting finding with these. Why does all of a sudden the nerve not have that radiculopathy component uh, in the setting of continued compression? You know, we think that nerve edema alterations in nutritional transport and axonal conduction inhibition lead to some of these symptoms, uh, both from the compressive and the inflammatory uh, side of things. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.